Welcome everybody. So in this uh, colloquium I will uh, present six years of work that, we, that are bundled in my thesis, Untying the Knot, mechanistically understanding the interactions between social forages and their prey. And I will uh, start by taking you to the mudflats of the Dutch Wadi Sea. Uh, during low tide period, these mudflats are uh, exposed and they're very extensive, large areas. And in these mudflats, there's a lot of life. There's a lot of animals living there, like worms and shellfish. And at first glance, it might seem similar, but when you dig in the mud, at some places you'll find a lot of shellfish, and in other places it's virtually empty, it's very poor. So, uh, on these animals that live in the mudflat, many predators are dependent on them, and, uh, such as birds. These, uh, here you see a flock of red knots in the background, and these birds have found a patch of cockles to feed on. And if you see this, on how, you immediately think, how do they find their prey that are buried in the sediment or in the mudflats? <laughs> how do they know in such a large area where to find it? And uh, this brings, brings me to my thesis. So, untie the knot. The question, examples of questions that we ask in the thesis, in my thesis are, do predators use each other to find their hidden food? Or do individuals differ in the way they search for their food? And what are the effects of predation on their prey densities? And can we predict the spatial distribution of the predators based on the spatial distribution of their prey? And these uh, questions are very interesting from a scientific point of view, but there also there is also an applied uh, side to it, especially the last point, uh, the spatial distribution of animals. That's, uh, that, that's especially relevant from an applied scientific point of view. For instance, the, the, this is the, yeah, just know the Dutch Wadden Sea. It's, uh, it's a unique area. It's the largest intertidal area in the world and it's very important for all kinds of uh, life. It's, for the, it's a spawning area for fish. It's a fueling area or a wintering area for migrating birds. And this uh, natural importance is also recognized by the authorities. It's also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. But at the same time, such an area is under threat by uh, climate change or sea level rise. It's, uh, there's disturbance from tourism. There's fisheries. Uh, there's plans for salt uh, drilling, salt extraction, salt mining. There's gas drilling. And there's also a, an Air Force practice, a shooting range in it. So all these kind of different kinds of disturbances, it's also important to know, because it's such an important natural area, uh, what the effects of all these activities are on the, on the animals living there. And for this you also need to know what the important areas are and uh, understand the spatial distribution and the mechanisms and why they are found somewhere and not elsewhere. So our study species is the red knot. This is, uh, yeah, we know a lot about the red knot and we can uh, uh, yeah, we, uh, uh, untie all these mechanisms or study all these mechanisms. But keep in mind that it, this uh, thesis, is, even though it's studied on knots, it's not only about knots. So that we unravel mechanisms that are also relevant to many different, other, different species. So this is the, the red knot. It uh, breeds in the Arctic. There's two subspecies. One breeds in Greenland and uh, Canada. And the other subspecies breeds in Siberia. And you're given in blue and red. They're around the period of July. Then they migrate to the mudflats of the Western Wadden Sea. Here, they, uh, uh, the subspecies that breeds in Siberia migrates onwards to Africa, and the Islamica subspecies that breeds in Canada and uh, uh, Greenland, they stay here in uh, Western Europe. And this is the main the subspecies that I study most, most particularly. So when they come to the Dutch Wadden Sea, or any Wadden Sea in the Intertidal Mudflat, these knots, they probe the sediment in search of their bivalve prey, and they do this in groups. And I've got a little clip to show you about how they do this. Oh, there it is. So you see that it goes very fast, it probes the sediment, and it's found a cockle. And you see that it swallows it in whole. <coughs> and I slowed it down, that you can take a better look. The cockle is almost too large for it to swallow. <coughs> Also, because they swallow their prey whole, these knots, they have a very large uh, stomach, a muscular stomach, and that's what we call a gizzard, to crush these, uh, these bivalves that they swallow whole. 
And because they do this, they're very, it's very muscular. And it's also measurable with ultrasound. <coughs> so in live animals, we can, uh, we can put the scanner, or Ona can put the scanner on these individuals. And as you see there in the top right, uh, this red circle, we can estimate from these measurements, we can estimate for live individuals what their gizzard masses are. And as you can see here, it varies between, let's say, 6 and 16, 15 grams. And for a bird that weighs only 120 grams, it's quite a substantial amount of their body weight. It's a muscular stomach, this gizzard. And there's also a lot of variation between birds. And this variation is also related to their diet. So uh, these different prey items, so in the top you see some small cockles, in the middle is a Baltic talon and shore crab at the bottom. And these species also differ in their quality. And quality is what we define as the amount of energy over ballast material, shell material. For instance, a cockle has a very thick shell. So given its shell, there's very little flesh. And if uh, uh, to obtain a certain intake rate or energy uh, where a bird aims for, it needs to process a lot of shell material when it feeds on cockles to get enough energy. So and to process that volume of shell material, it needs a very large gizzard. And on the other side, you have, on the bottom side, you have uh, shore crabs. It's very high quality. So to obtain the same amount of energy, it doesn't need to process that much of shell material. So it can suffice with a smaller gizzard. And you could think, you might think, that why not all red knots forage on these high-quality prey items? They all do prefer it, but there's also an inverse relationship with prey density. So these high-quality prey are very hard to find. Then we come to the first question. Do knots use each other to find hidden food? To study this question, we uh, captured a group of knots in the wild. We brought them back to the aviaries here at NEOS. And we have the experimental shorebird facility here, where we designed this experiment, where we have different patches. And these patches, they contain sand. And in one, out of these, one of these patches, we bury prey items. And then, in uh, varying group uh, compositions, and group sizes from one to four, <coughs> we measured how long it would take these birds to find the prey items, or to find the patch that contained prey. Groups of one to four, we tested them. Now if you look at the results, uh, if you look at searching time first, so on the y-axis you see searching time as a function of group size on the x-axis. There you see, it's a, note that it's a logarithmic scale. You see that the time that it takes an individual to find the food patch declines with group size. And also if you look at the number of patch visits before an individual <coughs> found the food patch, that also declines with uh, group size. So from these results, we, uh, we conclude that if nuts do, find, do use each other to find their hidden food. So it makes them more efficient foragers to forage in flocks.